A job stream in AAI is an essential structure that the product is built around. So today we will cover how to create a job stream and we will also review the essential properties of a job stream and how to set them up and what sort of effect they have on the job stream that's being created. So I am looking at the AI environment that has Autosys connected to it and that's what I'm going to use to create my job stream. So on the left hand side I have my business areas and I'm going to be working inside of the asset wealth. Uh, so I'm going to click on the plus just above the business area panel and that's going to open a couple of panels and there are different options here. So essentially the, the two elements of a job stream are the target job. So that's the end point uh, for the job stream. It's the last job in a job stream that we associate an SLA with. And the other piece of information that you would need is the actual SLA and we will cover that in a second when we look at the definition of a job stream. So once you open up this dialog we need to specify the target job. So I happen to know that there is a job in Autosys that describes the asset management daily summary. Uh, so that's the process that I'm interested in. If I click the find button, that's going to bring back the parentage as well as the scheduler name for that particular target job. And at the bottom, you will see how many jobs are going to be in this job stream, as well as how many historical runs exist in the database for this particular job stream. So the historical data can be either accumulated from current activity or could be preloaded into the system from archive files. So I'm going to click OK here and I will be on another dialog. Uh, notice that there is a more button that allows you to specify some additional properties one of them is whether you would like to make this job stream available for monitoring and alerts. So that essentially makes this job stream available in a under monitoring tab right here in the upper right corner. The same checkbox idea for forecasting as well as marking the job stream as critical. So I checked all three of them. And then there are some additional tabs at the bottom that basically allow you to do trimming. You can enter a description for a job stream and you can also enable some alerts. I will come back to these properties later once I create the job stream. And the one important comment here is that it is very strongly recommended that the name of the job stream is a descriptive name that doesn't really use any scheduling details like the job name or some cryptic piece of information that typically only scheduling folks know about. So the idea here for the name is to have a job stream name that just stands on its own and it basically describes the process that the job stream represents. So in my case, this is going to be asset management daily summary. The reason why we recommend that this is a descriptive name is because folks who are non-technical might be looking at AAI searching for a status or some other piece of information they are interested in and they might not be familiar at all with Autosys and underlying naming conventions and prefixes and so forth. So having a good name for a job stream is, is really key for finding information 
by folks who are non-technical. So I'm going to come back to the general tab and talk about a few things here. When you are starting out with AI and you're creating job streams for the first time, or maybe you are creating the first batch of job streams inside of the UI, things are not going to be perfect immediately. So you might want to choose a much smaller amount of data to be processed for this particular job stream so that you're not waiting a long time on the initial create for a job stream. So one way of doing that would be to use the include runs since. Uh, so here I can open up a calendar and I'm recording this session on the 22nd. So I'm going to say maybe give me runs since the first of the month and that's going to be sufficient for my purposes. So that's going to amount to 22 historical runs. Whereas if we took the default I would have had 141 runs. So for the initial setup or when you are experimenting with the tool and you are setting up job streams initially, it's a good idea to make that number of historical runs small so that you are not waiting for a long time to process 141 runs for this particular job stream. So I'm going to press OK here, which will initiate the creation process. And notice that I chose the asset wealth for my business area, and that's where I expect this job stream to show up. And there it is. Uh, so if I click on it, I'm going to have the middle panel that uh, shows the list format for the jobs that comprise this job stream. And on the right hand side, I'm going to have a Gantt chart view that shows dependencies between jobs and critical path in red and other information that's important for this particular job stream. And interestingly, on the 22nd, which is today, we have an, a run of this job stream that exceeded the SLA. So this red line on the right hand side is the lay time, the SLA for the job stream. And I'm going to cover that next. But before I do that, I just wanted to mention that the line of blue dashes is average end time. So that represents the average execution time for this entire job stream. So let's open up the definition of this new job stream. So I'm going to click on the pencil right here. And let me just walk you through some of the properties here. So we've been on the uh, general tab. Uh, let me just briefly mention what trimming is for. You can think of a job stream as a set of jobs that are related and that execute together and they culminate in a successful completion of uh, the target job. But there are use cases when you need to reduce that set of jobs. Maybe you need to eliminate some jobs that represent common code, for example. So trimming allows you to do that and we will record a separate video to talk about techniques uh, for trimming. But uh, in general, this is a facility that allows you to identify trimming points that would eliminate jobs from a job stream. So let's talk about the SLAs. So this is under the late criterion tab. By default, you get a system calculated SLA when you create a job stream for the first time. And you will notice some information here. So for instance, you know, we have how many runs have been used to calculate this system calculated late criterion. And there are two SLAs that are user specified. 
The first one is an end time. So this is a point in time that you are defining as the SLA for a job stream. So I'm going to plug in 1045 just for round numbers here. And essentially what that means is that we expect this job stream to end by 10.45 p.m. And if it continues executing beyond 10.45, it's considered late. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to save this to kind of illustrate to you how this red line is, is uh, related, how the red line basically is the rendering of the time that we specify here. So you saw that this line moved uh, to the right, and that is precisely because I specified 1045 as the SLA for, uh, for the job stream. The other user specified SLA is a fixed duration. So here we are specifying the amount of time that we expect this job stream to take. So let's say if I defined that as, let's say, 242, just for round numbers again, what this means is that if this job stream executes longer than two hours, 42 minutes, it is considered late. The fixed duration SLA comes in handy for processes that run multiple times per day. So it doesn't matter if it runs in the morning, maybe midday, and then in the afternoon. What matters is how much time this process takes. So it's a different type of SLA from the end time, from a point in time, which was this middle option that uh, I have covered already. So I'm going to cancel out of here, uh, and I'm going to say no to go back um, to my end time, point in time SLA. So the other thing I wanted to cover is that when you establish the SLA, the next logical thing that you might want to do is alerting. So what happens if this SLA gets exceeded? How can I have that information? How can I propagate that signal from AAI and maybe send it to where I wanted to register? So let me just open the definition of this job stream again. And I will talk about two alerts here, the late alert as well as not predicted to finish. So the late alert is a very important alert because it is predictive. So for long running processes, we might have a situation where the prediction engine in AAI might realize many hours before the SLA is due that uh, this SLA is in jeopardy. So that's gonna be based on calculations with actual numbers that are coming in into AAI from the scheduler and also predictions that are being generated uh, by the prediction engine. And based on that information, AAI might determine that the SLA will likely be missed. So the late alert is generated when the prediction engine determines that the SLA is in jeopardy. And, and the important point here is that that could be happening hours before the SLA is due. So that's a good thing because it, this is an early warning system that allows you to think about the problem or maybe communicate with downstream process owners. It allows you to reach out to the consumers of the information that was supposed to be generated by this process. So you essentially gain reaction time by having this alert, by having this alert early in the process, not at the time when the SLA is actually exceeded. 
The other alert here is not predicted to finish, and we call it NPTF for short. It is called not predicted to finish because it stands for a situation when the execution of a job stream is stopped. There is either a failure of a job or maybe another reason like a termination or on ice or on hold for autosys. And essentially the execution of this job stream is not progressing, so things are stopped. So N the NPTF alert stands for a situation where an operator has to get involved to get things going again. So NPTF alert basically signals the need for human intervention. Somebody has to get into the scheduler and fix the offending condition and get things going again, get the execution running again. Notice that uh, there are a couple of standard distribution protocols here for these alerts. So one of them is SNMP. So if you are using a central console, an, S an SNMP server, where you receive SNMP traps, this would be a good way to propagate alerts from AAI. The other protocol here is email, so that is SMTP, and this is used for distributing alerts to people's mailboxes, and different teams use different techniques for uh, distributing alerts, so the email is available here straight out of the box. Another way of distributing alerts that I would mention, which is not available here, but it's available on the back end of the AI platform, is a publish subscribe infrastructure that's accessible through the REST API. So that method of consuming alerts is typically used for integration with existing pieces of infrastructure. Uh, so if you need to receive an alert from AAI and forward it, let's say, to a piece of analytics that already exists in your environment, that typically would be the best way to do that. And uh, the top level details of that is that there are topics that you would subscribe to through REST and essentially provide a callback routine where those alerts would be forwarded whenever an alert shows up on a topic. So those are alerts. So uh, I consider the late and not predicted to finish alerts uh, the, the sort of the most basic set of alerts that I expect customers to enable. And obviously there are other ones here that you can set up, but those two are very important and they stand for exception based conditions in the system. So it's very important to have them enabled. So that concludes the review of the properties of a job stream and I hope this was helpful.